Hi, welcome back to Christine's Home Affairs. Today we're going to make a little fabric storage basket and I plan on doing this two different ways. One of the techniques that I'll be using will be just with my regular uh, industrial sewing machine. The other technique will be using my regular old Janome sewing machine. The other thing I'm going to be doing is using two different stabilizers. One is going to be Decaville and it's a fusible product it's quite stiff and the other one is a Matilda's Own bag batting. Now Matilda's Own is an Australian made batting it's not non-fusible it's very much like Paltex except that it's not fusible. It's a nice rigid stabilizer both of them are. So we're going to use both stabilizers I'm going to show you how to make a pattern for this. Today we're also going to be drawing a hexagon in any size that you like. I'll do two different sizes to show you how easy it is and I've learnt another way to make hexagons which is so simple. The project we're doing today this is my template so far I like to play with paper when I'm work, trying to work out a new design. It will be um, a hexagon with some tentacles coming off it and then it'll be folded up to make a basket because we can never have enough baskets now can we so this one is going to be a little bit bigger for the clips that I like to use uh, I can always do with more baskets I'm sure you can too it will look a lot prettier than this so stick around and I will show you how to make this storage basket okay we're about to draw this shape here this uh, is a circle it's been turned into a hexagon and then we've got some arms coming out from the sides. This one here is done with a two and a half inch radius. So the circle itself is five inches and then we have two and a half inch wedges all the way around for our hexagons. I'm going to do one a little bit larger and show you how to create the pattern for yourself. You can take any circle you like. You can use a plate, a cup, whatever you prefer. You want to have it at least say five inches across. This one here is six inches and I actually have my um, 360 degree markings on the ruler as well which is very handy. So for this one here I'm just going to place the circle in the center of the paper. We want a fair sized paper because you're going to have these arms coming off the circle and we want to divide this into six equal segments. Now this one's easy for me because it's a 360 degree ruler and I've got my markings on here. So six sections will be divided into 60 degree increments. So it's 120, 180, 240 and 300 up to our 360. If you don't have a compass and all you're using is a plate, that's fine. I'm going to show you how to work that out. Work out the distance of the widest point of your circle. And for this, it is six inches at the widest point. So knowing now that that is a six inch circle across there, we just need to halve that, which is three inches. It'll work the same with your centimeters as well. To start marking our sides for a hexagon without the benefit of a compass and the degrees, all you need to do is take your ruler and line that up on the edge of the circle at one point and then move it down until that three inch mark there. And then you can just draw a line from the zero to the three inches. From that line there, you'll measure three inches again. So you'll line up that three inches on the edge of your circle and you'll do that all the way around until you've got your hexagon. So if you don't have the benefit of a compass and you're drawing a circle with a plate, that's how easy it is to mark the lines and get yourself a hexagon with any size circle. Because I've got the benefit of a compass, I'm going to line up the ruler along those marks that I've made earlier. And because this is a six inch circle, I want to draw a line going all the way through, but I want to add three inches to the outside. So I've got three inches, draw the line all the way through and continue on for another three inches. I'll do the same here, connect the lines. So if your circle was five inches, then you would extend your line two and a half inches. We're going to draw this line here, three inches out, 
and then we'll do this one as well and you'll notice that I haven't drawn my hexagon just yet but we're just about to now and now we're just going to connect these lines here and you'll notice from the 10 inches to the 13 that gives me a nice 3 inch line now I'm going to extend this out so between these two wedges here from there I'm just going to draw a line up in line with these lines that I've drawn already so if you can see that just draw your line all the way up if you go too far that's fine it won't be a problem because we'll close the curve on this shortly now we'll move the ruler around to this side we'll do the same thing Now I'm sure this all looks very confusing right now but it's really not. We've got a hexagon in around here and this is going to be the finished shape of our basket when we're done. These arms here are going to be the sides that will weave into each other. On the edge here I've marked just a little line there so that I know where to start my curve. I'll take a glass and I'll line up the edge of the glass so that it sits right beside the widest point sits right here and then I can make a curve going out like that. So we've got our markings coming out here and we want to extend a curve beyond that. We'll do that for all six arms. Okay, there we go. We can now cut out our pattern. So what we're going to do is cut this out around the outside here, down here, up, around, down, and so on. We don't need to cut the circle or the hexagon. I know the worst part of starting any project, uh, especially one that you might not be familiar with, is working out the pattern. It can be quite daunting sometimes. Once you get the pattern right, your home and hose you'll be able to use the same pattern to make as many of these baskets as you like although the pattern looks a little bit complicated watching it is a little bit different to actually going through the process so I recommend pausing the video for every step it'll be much easier for you to work it out okay once you've cut all your arms out then you can cut your curves Okay, now we have our pattern made up. I'm just going to go through some of the dimensions with you. We've done a circle that's six inches and each side is three inches. So the sides of your hexagon are half the size of your circle. The arms that come out extend out an extra three inches from the center of the circle. And then you'll just bring this line up on the hexagon, bring it in line with that three inches there, and then just make a curve at the end. From the very center of the circle here to this side of the arm is six inches in total. From here out to this one is also six inches. So all of your arms are going to extend out six inches from the center. The side of the hexagon is just going to extend out in line with that previous line. And then you just draw any kind of curve. You don't have to have a curve if you want to have a diagonal edge you can have a diagonal there and go straight across and then come back down diagonally again similar to an envelope. If you want to get really adventurous you can actually make this scalloped as well. So each of our hexagon sides are three inches. Let's find some fabric and stabilize it and we'll start putting this together. With my pattern cut out I've now got my stabilizer ready. If you hear any grinding or banging in the background, that's our tilers doing the bathroom in the next room. So I do, I do apologize for the noise. What I'm using here is a really stiff bag batting and it's very much like Peltex. So this is Peltex, which is fusible on one side and not on the other. And this is the bag batting that I'm using. So there's very little difference in the thickness of them. If you have Peltex that would be better because you can fuse it. This one's not fusible uh, and it's a Matilda's own which is an Australian made bag batting. Grab two pieces of batting and if your circle is a six inch circle then you need to have at least 12 inches of stabilizer. What I've done is traced my pattern out onto my batting and I'm just going to pin it together and cut them both out. Because we need two separate pieces, I've just pinned them both together and I'll cut them out at the same time.
Once you've cut out your two shapes, don't throw these pieces away. I'll come up with another project to use all of these little pieces some other time. What we need now is fabric. We need two pieces of fabric for each one of these and it's up to you if you want to have contrast fabric. I've made this one here. Um, I'm going to make this one slightly differently but I've got the pink pattern and the plain pink on the other side and on this one here I'm actually using Decaville. So I've fused Decaville onto one side of my fabric here and I've cut the fabric to the same size as my Decaville. This one here I'm going to do slightly differently. What you need for each one of these you need two pieces of fabric. I'll set one aside for the time being. I've got a red and white spot and I've got the watermelon print. If you've got a fusible product iron your fabric onto one side of your stabilizer and you'll do that for both pieces but we don't want to cut this fabric out. We're just going to fuse it straight down onto one piece of fabric. Because mine's not fusible, I could either go and use a basting spray and spray it just to make it adhere to the fabric. I'm not going to do that. I'm actually going to quickly just go and quilt this into place and then that way it's going to sit nicely for me. Because it's stiff, I need to turn this through later. I don't want any movement in it. So I'm just going to quickly go and quilt this onto one piece of fabric and I'll do that for both of them. Okay now as I said I didn't have a fusible stabilizer for this part here so I've gone and quilted some lines. All I've done is a hexagon around the fabric one layer and then just done a diagonal around each of the arms. Once you've done that grab your contrast fabric and we're going to place them right side together. Place that face up, this one faced down and pin this together. So just make sure everything's lined up on both sides and we can pin this together and we're going to take this to the machine and stitch it all the way around every single one of these arms. We're not going to stitch on the stabilizer, we're going to stitch right beside it. We do want to make an opening for turning through later and we'll probably do that on one of the longer sides here. For now I'm going to go and sew all the way around the entire piece including the area where I'm going to close it up. Say this is where I want to have my opening. I'm going to do a back stitch here, come all the way around, sew all the way around the entire piece, come back here, do a back stitch but I'll continue on and sew that closed. The reason for that, I want the fabric to know that it's actually going to be folded under later. So let's take this to the machine. We'll do both of them and we are going to stitch all the way right around, right just on the very edge of the stabilizer. Okay, ready to sew. I've reduced my stitch length to 2.3. Normally I do a 2.5 or 2.7. This time around I'm going to have just a small, slightly smaller stitch length. And I'll start about here, back stitch, continue on all the way around till I get back here, back stitch, but then continue on. When you come to the intersecting point there, just put your needle in the down position, turn your work around and come back down the side. As you come to the curve, you just want to go very slowly because you want your curves to look really nice when they've been turned through. I've come back to the beginning here and then I'll go and do the next one. Okay, both pieces have been sewn together and this is how it looks on the other side. All you've got here is an outline of the stabilizer that you've used. And this was the reason why I actually wanted to go and quilt this onto the one piece of fabric. Because I didn't have a fusible, it needed to stay in place because we're not actually stitching on it. What we can do now is cut this down to within a quarter of an inch of the seam that we've just stitched. And we're just going to cut the fabric just like we cut the stabilizer earlier. And when you cut your wedge out, we're going to cut into the point here, but don't cut through the stitching line. You just want to cut really close so that we can turn this around and it doesn't tighten up the corners. Yeah. <laughs> 
sometimes I forget I have the perfect tool for cutting around curves and that is the tiny little rotary cutter. So that just helps go around the curves really easily or more smoothly than it does with scissors. Um, the other thing you'll notice that I'm doing on the curves is cutting a little bit closer to the stitching line and that just helps the fabric sit nicer on the curves when you turn it through. Okay, we have cut out our fabric and now we can find where we've done the double stitching for the opening. And for me, you can see the double stitching just here. So I'm just going to open up the stitches in between there. Before I do that, I'm just going to finger press this seam and that'll help set that fold so that when we top stitch shortly and we've turned everything the right way around, it'll sit really nicely against that stabilizer that we've got. So just fold that up on both sides, set that crease. And you want to do that beyond the opening as well. You don't have to go and do that for the rest of it. It really doesn't matter. It's all going to be turned through and nobody will notice it. Okay, so just in this section here where I've double stitched from beginning to end, I'll open this up and then I'll turn everything the right way around and I'll do that for both pieces. So you can see that seam wants to sit down nice and flat and that'll just make it a lot easier to give you a nice edge when you're top stitching this closed. Let's bring all the arms out. It's a little bit fiddly doing this but I actually think I prefer this method to um, stitching the edges all the way around on two separate pieces whether it be blanket stitching or satin stitching. I think this way is just in the end a little bit quicker. When you've turned this the right way around and you've and you've shaped your edges if you've got an opening at the top here where it's frayed a little bit that's due to a couple of things. This top fabric here that I've got is a little bit loose, a weave, so um, it's come away from the stitching very easily and I've also when I've cut the curve I've cut too close to the edge of the stitching line because the fabric is such a loose weave it was able to come out from the stitching very easily um, and that was one of the reasons why I wanted to have a smaller stitch length to try and prevent that from happening but I should have used a tighter weave fabric on this side and I shouldn't have clipped too close to the edge. When this happens if you can't tuck it under and top stitch around then you just bring that arm back through and as I've done on this one here, I've gone and restitched the curve. And when you do that, you only need to pull one of the arms back through to stitch up again. You don't have to go and turn the whole thing the wrong way around. Okay, now that these two have been pressed, we can take it to the machine and go and top stitch. We want to close the opening. We're going to top stitch very close to the edge all the way around. And we'll do that right around the entire shape. We'll do that for both pieces. I'll just start where the opening is and then sew all the way around. And we will repeat that for this one as well. Okay, both pieces have been top stitched. We are now ready to put it together. But before we do, I'm going to take you through the other one. And this one is done using a five inch circle. It has two and a half inch wedges and five inch from the edge, from the side to the center. So this one's a little bit smaller than this one here. There are the two shapes there. So a fair bit of size difference. Now I've got two pieces of fabric here. I've fused Decavoil. So in this one here, I'm using Decavoil instead of the Peltex or the bag batting. It's a little bit thinner, but still got really good structure to it. And this one's fusible. So I fused it to one side of my fabric on each of these. And instead of having one big piece of fabric and stitching around the side of the 
stabilizer we're actually going to either satin stitch or blanket stitch around the entire edge of this a little bit more time consuming a lot more thread it's a decorative feature but when you're doing something smaller like this you definitely don't want to have to turn all these little arms through so I'm going to show you both ways of constructing this particular bag so before we put the other one together let's go and secure the layers together and I'm going to be using my regular uh, domestic sewing machine for this as well so the first stitch we're going to do is a really narrow zigzag so I'm just using the zigzag stitch which is number three here my settings are I've got the stitch length setting on its smallest that's so about half and the stitch width I've got that set to the widest you can play around with this and have it as wide or narrow as you like and the stitch length you want it really close together because you want to be able to close up all those fibers on the edge and the foot that I'm using is just the see-through foot that you get with your sewing machine you can use your regular foot as well before you go and do anything with your real project it pays to just use some scrap fabric and try it out using the stabilizer that you're actually using on your project so I've got my presser foot down I've got my project underneath my machine and I'm just going to play around with this zigzag and see if I like that and I want the needle to come down on the very edge of my fabric here and then the width of the zigzag will come in on the sides And as you're coming around the corner, you might want to lift your foot just slightly. There we have the zigzag stitch all the way around there. And you can see it's a really, really close stitch. We've got the widest stitch, but the shortest stitch length, which brings all of those lines together. Let's try this with a blanket stitch now. Now I wanted to try a blanket stitch but it turns out I don't actually have one on this machine. The closest I've come to is this stitch here which is number 20 but as you can see here it's too much of a diagonal. I can't actually get the stitches closer together because it won't adjust. It'll adjust the width but it won't adjust the length. So I'm going to stick with just a regular zigzag really close together with a very wide stitch. If you have a blanket stitch on your machine I'd give that a go. Try a shorter stitch length, a wider stitch width and have it a little bit more dense and see how you like that. Okay so for my machine the best option for me is to use a very wide zigzag very close together and I'll probably see you in about a week it's going to go very slow start anywhere you like have your fabric on the edge there where the needle is at its widest point so you want to just bring your needle down find the widest part of the zigzag adjust your fabric so that it sits right on the edge there and make sure you keep it in that same alignment all the way around and here we go When you get to the corners you want to do a few stitches, turn it ever so slightly and I'm not going to take you on this journey this is going to take quite a while so I'm just going to go ahead and stitch around all the sides of this. Now that we have both of our whirly gigs done it's time to start putting this together. If you look at these two here, we've got them both in exactly the same orientation. We want one to sit over the top of the other and sit in the opposite orientation. Line up these arms so that the hexagon shape here sits on top of that hexagon shape underneath. And you can check that by just folding these little arms or tentacles up, getting that hexagon shape, and just making sure it sits roughly the same as the one underneath. I'm going to go to the machine to secure both pieces together by just stitching over the top of this stitched line that I have had earlier. All right, both hexagon sections have been secured and we now need to bring these flaps up. So all we have to do is we take the front flap and the back flap and bring that together like that. So we've got the top flap and the bottom flap. The bottom one needs to sit 
over the top of the inside there. So bring the left side up, the right side up and in and clip it which makes the top one come up automatically and then you just bring the back one up and to the front and clip it. Same again we've got the top one that sits up, bring the back one to the front and keep on going. You can actually go the other way and have the inside up and then they bring the back one and place it to the back but it defeats the purpose of having two different fabrics because as you're going around all you're going to be seeing is the red spots on both sides. By going in a clockwise direction we're going to have a nice staggered color scheme happening. So keep going we've got inside up the outside to the front and there we have the shape of our basket so far. Once you've clipped them all together all that's left for us is to sew a few buttons on the outside. So we've got these two arms that come in this direction and this one underneath that goes in the other direction. We want to sew a button on here so that we can secure all of the layers together. It's a little bit difficult to secure all the layers together just with a button so you can go and with a needle and thread and just stitch these layers together and then put your button on top but I'm going to cheat and go to the machine and I'm just going to do a very quick back stitch just along here just a few stitches forward a few stitches back and secure those three layers in place just so that it's going to make it easier for me to hand sew my buttons on after that. So this is going to be a little bit awkward for you to see so just take the edges here bring them together and lay that face down. I might just turn these out so that you can see a little bit better and I'll pop that under the machine and all I want to do is go forward back and forward again. And that will be enough to secure those layers in place and then I can pop a button on each of those places there that'll hide the stitching and add a nice decorative feature. So I'll do that all the way around. If there are any areas that you haven't caught on one side you can just go back and actually just extend that. So that stitching on the sides has secured all of the layers down and now it's going to sit in place nicely whilst I sew on some buttons. So I've just got an assortment of buttons. I'm not worried about sizing or anything. Just a random selection of buttons. And I have my thread and I've got two strands of thread through the eye of the needle and doubled that over. So I've got four strands of thread. That just means that I don't have to go through the buttonhole so many times. And I'm going to come up in between the layers here and then start sewing the buttons on. So that just adds a nice decorative feature and it hides all that untidy stitching that's there. So I will go and sew all of these buttons down and I'll show you how it looks when it's all finished. There is our finished basket. All the buttons have been stitched on around the side and as I said earlier they're all different buttons so it just adds a little bit of interest to it all from this six inch pattern. It's a lot bigger than the current basket that I use for clips so I can easily put those in there and a heap more and benefit of this one is that I can even use these sections here to store some of my tools. So I can put my rulers, seam ripper, a small pair of scissors, I can put a couple of pens in there things like that. So it is quite a versatile little bowl. Now you did see that I was working on two of them. I haven't quite finished this pink one. I started doing the blanket stitching or the zigzagging on my machine and it was skipping stitches. So it looked absolutely ghastly. So I'm going to have to take this to work and do the blanket stitching or the zigzag on my other machine at the shop. So I will finish this at some stage but I wanted to show you how that looks as a smaller bag. So clip together the same way. I've got all the same fabric on the outside and the planes on the inside. And that one is made using the five inch template. So the five inch template makes that size bowl and the six inch template makes that size bowl. So there's quite a bit of difference when you have a look at the two together. 
but that's how easy it is to make your templates. And this hexagon bowl was also drafted recently, but I used a different technique to create the hexagon. So I'll pop a link up for this particular bowl so that you can have a look at the two different ways of making hexagons. And then you can turn them into anything else after that. So what did you think? I'm going to be honest and tell you I almost threw this away. It's not a difficult project to make. I don't think it turned out as nice as it should have. I've got these curved edges here which have got sharp edges to it. I didn't turn everything through the right way. I didn't trim my fabric properly which meant that I have little pointy bits in the curves. So I'm not happy with that. It's a better project for hand sewing in that you can actually bring these edges up and have it sitting nice and flat. So it's not perfectly even. To you guys it'll look nice but I can see all the flaws. I could have done better. This one here has been doing my head in because I tried to do this on just my regular domestic machine. I wanted to have raw edges because it's such a small project and it was going to be very difficult to turn it through. So I wanted to either have blanket stitch or a zigzag on the edges and have that as a decorative feature. My machine failed me but I don't think I'll give up. I'll take this to work and I'll go and blanket stitch around the edges. I did try blanket stitching by hand but because I've used the Decaville on the inside here it's just too stiff to sew by hand. I'll do this at a later date. Anyway I hope you've enjoyed this video and learning another technique for drafting hexagon shapes in any size. So hopefully you've learned something there. Let me know if you're going to give this a go. I'm, I'm going to use it even though I don't think it's turned out perfectly. It's just for me I don't need perfection and but I do need a bigger basket for my clips at work. So I'm going to use this at the shop and hopefully one day I'll finish this one. Anyway I hope you've enjoyed this video and I shall catch you next time. Bye for now.